Hi, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast, which is a new series entitled Dealing with Childhood Trauma and Its Effects. This podcast aims to provide hope and answers and take away the stigmas of post-traumatic childhood trauma. Dr. Dana Philosaint is a professional counselor whose focus is on childhood traumas. So today's topic is five ways to address the awful feeling of shame that follows childhood trauma. Hi, Dr. Dana Philosaint. Hi, I'm glad I'm back again. So today is a really rough topic. We're talking about shame. Yeah, it's a really powerful topic. So first of all, what is shame? Well, shame is regarded as being a negative emotion that arises when a person sees or judged by others, whether it be something that they imagine, whether it be something that is possible or actually is present, according to some researchers. In the Webster's Dictionary, shame is actually described as an unpleasant self-conscious emotion, typically associated mm-hmm. with an evaluation of oneself, um, things like, a, and they tend to have a withdrawal emo- uh, motivation, uh, feelings of distress, or being exposed, feeling of mistrust, or powerless, or worthlessness. So there's a lot of uh, emotions that's tied to it indirectly. Um, at the same time, too, you can have individuals that try to hide that shameful feeling by removing themselves from others and, and so forth and so on. So it's, it's a humiliating feeling. It's very deep down inside, and it's a very, very powerful force that um, oftentimes we don't even see it in, uh, addressed enough in research or even, you know, in the health field and how is it connected with health and medicine and those kinds of things as well. So it's, it's definitely something that we need to talk about, especially since it's something that uh, individuals dealing with trauma deal with very, very regularly. Okay. All right, great. And how is shame, um, I know you talked about it, shame is something that happens after trauma. How is the shame related to other emotions that people might be feeling? There was a research done by Webb in 2010, and they looked at four emotions that are really associated with shame. Those feelings are fear, anger, distress, and disgust. So when a person can exhibit um, their shame in a way of anger, they might have an attack on others or in, in very aggressive feelings towards other people, so attack on others. If they have a feeling of disgust, they might exhibit it in, in hiding from self in a way of addiction, this individual study found, and then in a way if they express that shame in a way of distress, they might attack have an attack on themselves in a way of depression, or if they have a, a fear association with their shame, they might hide from others in isolation. So that was actually a very interesting study that looked at those four main feelings that are associated mostly with shame. Now, not to say that there aren't other emotions and feelings tied to it, but shame is one that's so deep down um, and, and it's, it's very conscious as well um, that we... Uh, can see and understand it in that light that it's associated with others as well. Okay, great. Now, which form of trauma is shame uh, mostly associated with? Yeah, so this one is one that I haven't seen any studies necessarily that says that this particular um, feeling of shame is associated with trauma. However, you know, it's so different for everyone Anybody who experienced trauma can feel a sense of shame, and um, they can also go through, through trauma and not experience shame. But one particular trauma that I did find, one research I talked about, was childhood um, sexual abuse. Now, that one seems to be very common, um, rather shame is, seems to be very common amongst those individuals who experience childhood abuse. Uh, in a study that was done by Kim and others, uh, in 2019, they found that shame played a role in uh, the way that they interact with their families, um, and so the family conflict that the individual felt, um, even as an adult, uh, was connected with the experience that they had when they were a child. So that was mm-hmm. the study that I found. And then, you know, 
the researcher indicated that the history of childhood sexual abuse is very uh, much associated with a high risk or high rate of self-blame and self-consciousness um, that tend to lead them into the direction of being feeling ashamed. I think you started answering um, my next question when you started talking about self-blame, but in mm-hmm. what ways does living with shame um, impact a person's life? Yeah. So, you know, it depends on the culture. It depends on the support system that they have. It depends on the belief system, their health, and all those things. But there were some studies that were showing the difference between individuals in the Western culture versus the Eastern culture. And they showed that individuals from the, uh, the West culture, which is like, you know, America uh, very uh, much have that sense of fear as um, they felt weakness within themselves, um, they felt a sense of isolation or rejection, um, but they made it very invisible part of their life where you couldn't tell unless I told you, um, where in the Eastern culture, you know, shame is very much associated with who the person is in terms of their group or in terms of their family. So that shame, whatever, whether it be something that was brought upon them, so like in, ter- in, in case of a trauma, that individual not only feels shame for themselves, but for their whole entire community or their whole entire family or their system um, that they're connected to. So the difference there, you see that, you know, within the Western culture, um, shame is something that's very individualized. Um, you know, I, I keep it to myself, and you may or may not know that I feel that sense of shame. But within the Eastern culture, you know, shame, whatever things might have happened to that individual, it brings shame to the whole community. And so there's a larger fear of of influence that individuals experience might have not only on themselves, but also others as well. So it's very interesting that, you know, just the idea of one's belief system and the culture that they're in might impact them in their lives a little bit differently as well. Um, Of course, it's the individualized and um, how people deal with shame might look differently, of course, but um, overall, generally speaking, that's what they were seeing. Wow. And their families' lives, too, I guess, like you said, depending on where they're from. Um, And we've seen cases like that uh, recently. Um, So what is the difference? I know you've talked about it, but can you go more into depth? What is the difference between shame and specifically guilt? So when, when you feel a sense of shame, most research indicates uh, the difference is that with shame, you feel that you are something wrong. But with guilt, the guilty feeling, you, you feel that it's based on something that you've done that is wrong. So the difference between the two is that guilt is a feeling of responsibility and remorse uh, towards something or offense or something that you've done wrong, whether it be real or imagined, by the way. But with shame, it's a painful feeling that arrives um, from a consciousness of something that's dishonorable, improper, or ridiculous, or something that was done to you or by someone, um, you know, either one, either way, to oneself or by someone else. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting, um, you know, feeling. As, as many researchers have said, clearly it is very complex. But that's the two difference between the, the two. Okay, so now, so done something done to you or by someone else, that's shame. So now can you compare um, the difference between embarrassment and, and shame? Okay, so in, the re- in researches that I was reading as well, you know, many people um, felt that the, the connection between embarrassment is mainly like a weaker form of shame, but that's not actually the case because shame is more intense and likely to be associated with a moral a transgression of some sort that one might feel was done towards them or they've done towards someone else. Um, and another thing, too, the, the difference between the two is that um, shame, you don't need an individual around you to have it, whereas embarrassment, on the other hand, tends to be associated with social connection. So if someone's around you, something happened, and then they saw it, and so that embarrassment might come um, in play but with shame, it can happen with you by yourself or when other people are around. So that's the main uh, difference that, uh, that are being um, shown between embarrassment and shame. Okay. 
Now that makes sense. I definitely understand that between the embarrassment and the shame. Thank you for that uh, clarification, uh, Dr. Dana. Now for our listeners, can you give five ways that an individual can address their their shame, since this topic is about shame, can you give five ways that an individual can address their shame so that they can live a life of joy and peace? Absolutely. I think that's the main important thing. I mean, all of this is, sorry, you can hear my dog outside barking, but all of this means absolutely nothing if we don't know how to apply it and make sense of it. So, you mm-hmm. know, here's, here's what I would say is five ways to address shame. One would be, uh, first, you need to identify how the shame that you're living with is paralyzing you. What do I mean by that? That's pretty much saying, you know, physically is it impacting your life. Some people, they have a hard time sleeping. They feel uh, like they lack concentration. They might have a knot in their stomach every time they think about something. Their de- just digestive system might have an issue. So first identify how is it impacting you physically. Uh, what sign do you feel, you know, every time you think of something that's causing you shame that it's impacting you physically? That's number one. The second one I would say is identify the root cause of your shame. Is it something that you've done or something that was done to you? Either way, you need to be aware of ways that you can bring awareness to it yourself so that you can help yourself or to help others. That's a very important aspect of it. Uh, the third one is find a reason to forgive and learn to forgive, either rather ask for forgiveness as well. That's another part of it. If it's something that you've done wrong um, or something that someone has done wrong to you, you know, we talked about forgiveness in our last uh, podcast. Uh, forgiveness is a necessary part in anything to address mental health. I'm going to let you know that right now. Um, but especially if you're dealing with shame, to, to address that, you have to bring that to your awareness um, that you need to address uh, shame with forgiveness. Um, and then another, and the fourth one I would say is learn how to, this is important, learn how to replace shame with love. Now, the greatest and best way to replace the feeling of shame is with the feeling of love for self or others. Shame seems to, you know, create a lot of havoc in families. It, it destroys families at times because you look at people differently. People might look at you differently. But when you can replace that with love, it repairs the damage that's done internally. Um, and the last, I would say, is do your own homework. You know, I'm, I'm sharing what the research is showing about shame and guilt and, you know, all these things. But when you do your own study, for example, if you open the Bible and study the word shame and you study it with um, the comparison word of love, you know, you compare the two, you see how beautifully that God wants to remove your shame, wants to remove our shame and replace it with love, um, you know, with his love. And there's so many texts that talk about it, but understanding the study of shame and guilt and embarrassment and all those things for yourself makes all the difference. And I'm going to leave you with this Bible text that I think find, um, you know, so much, I find so much encouragement in this text. It's from Isaiah 54, verse 4. It says, Fear not, you will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid. There is no more distress or disgrace for you. Let me read it again. It says, fear not, you will no longer live in shame. Don't be ashamed, of, don't be afraid, rather. There is no more disgrace for you. So that's on in Isaiah 54, verse 4. So some words for, for our listeners to remember those five steps and ways that they can address their own shame um, that they're dealing with. Fantastic, fantastic. I like those. You have some great takeaways. For those of you who didn't catch them, make sure you rewind the podcast. Go back and take your time and listen to the podcast again. If uh, you need more information or for resources, definitely go to mindcare.us if you have any questions. And, of course, definitely subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. Dr. Dana, thank you. It was an absolute pleasure. And for our listeners, come back and listen to our next podcast. Thank you. Bye-bye.